So, uh, so I wish uh, a very good afternoon to all uh, you ladies and gentlemen who have uh, joined here with us. Uh, today we are doing the ninth lecture of our lecture series, which we are doing on uh, on, a, on our Facebook group, uh, Sri Lanka Bird Identification and Discussion Group. So, as you know, uh, today uh, we are going to speak on yellow tails, which is uh, a white confusing but yet very interesting uh, topic. Right. So until recently, uh, yellow tails were not that much of a problem. Life <clears throat> was simple and we thought it is the Western yellow tail uh, that visit uh, the Indian subcontinent uh, to spend the winter. And with the use of uh, plumage details known at that time, we were able to separate the subspecies and, uh, and identify the birds. But now, Thanks to keen observers and putting and them putting more attention into extra details such as vocalization, uh, everything has become kind of a confusing thing. <laughs> so it seems that uh, with time, uh, things are becoming clearer, and we hope this discussion will clear things further. Up. So, uh, well, truly speaking, it's easy said than done. So still, it seems like we have a lot. To be understood. So today we thought of inviting several uh, ornithologists who are very keen birders and have worked extensively on yellow tails. So our main aim, uh, our aim today is not to give a hundred percent complete guide on how to identify yellow tails. I think it, it would be very hard or more almost impossible. But uh, but we hope to give an idea how complex this is and how carefully one should look into this matter. And we intend to detail uh, on what field uh, features a birder should look when, uh, when you're trying to identify uh, yellow tails and what are the details a birder should collect in the field. Uh, and also, uh, we, we, we will be discussing on how birders should report yellow tails uh, for databases like eBird. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, so, as uh, some of uh, you on this lecture already know, Dr. Gary Alport works for BirdLife International, but uh, today he is participating in a personal context in his uh, in this lecture as an ornithologist in his own right. So, Gary has been studying birds for most of his life, participating in uh, bird atlas work in the 1950s and visiting his first bird observatory in Fair Island in 1972 uh, when he was just 10 years old. So he was an active bird rigger and part of bringing uh, groups on waders in UK and was actively uh, and is an active man, was an active member of the uh, flycatcher study group in his team. He worked in Dungeons and uh, Budsey or bird ob observatories in the late uh, 1970s and then was uh, part of the bird survey teams in 1980s in his uh, in uh, Kenya, Indonesia, Korea, and Sri Lanka. Uh, he completed a PhD in feeding ecology of uh, bean goose in, in the United Kingdom and has published many papers uh, on bird identification, uh, new records, and behavior and ecology. He is active in uh, promoting birding worldwide especially with uh, up and uh, coming birders in the developing world. And he was a founder of the Oriental Bird Club and African Bird Club, and has also served as a council member of the Ornithological Society of uh, the Middle East. He has a particular passion for seabirds and has been living in Sri Lanka since August, 2019. So, uh, most of the time, you will find him sea watching around Colombo whenever the winds are favorable. Right? Uh, so, Gary was the first to note back, uh, yellow wagtails sounding different than the typical Western yellow wagtails here in Sri Lanka, and soon found out many fascinating things uh, following further investigation. So, I will let him speak the rest for you during uh, his presentation. And uh, the uh, next speaker is Professor Sampath Chaniratna. Uh, he completed his uh, BSc honors degree in zoology with the first class and two gold medals in 2002 and went to Canada for his postgraduate studies 
He studied evolution uh, in Arctic birds and received his PhD with a distinction from Memorial University, St. John's, Canada in 2008. He completed two postdoctoral fellows on uh, evolution and genomics at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, and Birds Canada, uh, and worked at Birds Canada, at, uh, Canada Ministry of Environment. In 2012, he joined the Department of Zoology and Environmental Science uh, at the University of Colombo as a senior lecturer and currently uh, works there as a professor. <laughs> professor Sampath uh, is currently a research scientist specialized in molecular ecology, evolutionary genetics, and on, on ecology, where he uses both field and laboratory based research grounds in a strong conceptual framework ranging from basic ecology. Uh, phylogenetics uh, to next level genomics to address processes underlying biological evolution, uh, island biogeography, and uh, causes of uh, endemism. Uh, he, uh, he has conceptualized and developed uh, the avian evolution north the laboratory at uh, the zoology department where they study molecular ecology and evolution. And he has three research stations across Sri Lanka in Beluholoya, which is called Isengard. Biosphere Center and one in Western Sinaraja uh, called the Laboratory for Molecular Ecology and Evolution and the Sandpiper House in Mena. So all these are dedicated to studies in ecology and evolution. So today, Professor Sampath will clear us on the phylogenetic aspects of the yellow tails in Sri Lanka under, understood so far. Then uh, we have uh, Dr. Ashwin Vishnath from India. Uh, he is a mechanical engineer turned ecologist and a long time uh, bird watcher. During his uh, master's and PhD, he studied plant biology and the effects of fragmentation on mechanisms that maintain plant diversity. During his uh, doctoral research, he became increasingly fascinated by the potential of citizen science to answer ecological questions. He now works with Bird Count India, a group that encourages bird watchers to systematically monitor birds and help generate knowledge from the data that emerges. Today, he will share with us the Indian yellow active story, which is another fascinating discovery. So to begin things, I invite Dr. Gary Alport to, to begin his presentation. Over to, you, over to you, Gary. Thank you very much, Monitor. Um, well, just to kick off, I have to say it's a really great pleasure to be here. Um, it's been quite an interesting few years when it comes to studying yellow wagtails and uh, I couldn't be more happy to see uh, uh, the group that we've got here speaking with uh, obviously Sampath from from Sri Lanka but also Ashwin from India you know we're put, starting to put together the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle I hope and it's fascinating that this uh, story has kind of emerged from different places but in parallel and uh, great to be able to put it together uh, uh, alongside each other today and very much look, looking forward to your presentation in particular, Ashwin. So it falls to me to, to start off by trying to explain um, the basics of, uh, of yellow wagtails. And as Monitor alluded, this is not a particularly easy topic to broach. And I'm conscious that there are people on the call that are from kind of every, every um, part of the spectrum of, of interest in yellow wagtails. So I'm trying to make sure that we start from um, the, uh, the, the, the basic outline of, of, of what's been happening with the yellow wagtails. And we'll kind of build on that and I suspect become more complex and less clear and less certain as we go along. But I hope that what we'll get out of this, those of you who are looking for clear answers from this um, discussion may go away a bit disappointed, um, but what we hope is to kind of set out what we think we know at this point, what we think we need to look at next and where the difficulties lie, um, and there's quite a lot of those. Um, so this is uh, still a work in progress, and those are some of the most ornith interesting ornithological puzzles, the ones where we don't know the answers and we're trying to find them. So it's a very, very interesting topic but not necessarily very easy to get your head around. So to start off with, to just um, explain some of the background. Up until about 10 years ago, uh, the yellow wagtail complex was considered one single species. Um, 
Motacilla flava and comprised many forms across the whole of the Paleoarctic and in fact bred across the Bering Strait in Alaska as well. Um, the topic of separating the different subspecies of, of yellow wagtail was always a, a complex one, but the difficulty or the um, application of our interest um, really changed gear about 10 years ago when the, uh, the study of the, the different subspecific forms increasingly showed that there were two major groups of yellow wagtails, which are now known as Western and Eastern yellow wagtail. So these have been recognized as a split now by all the major taxonomies. Uh, and that's happened in the last 10 years. Uh, it's interesting to note that some of the work that was done to underpin the decision by the major taxonomies was done by research groups, in fact, two major research groups, both of which they are still themselves unsure about the exact taxonomic position of the two forms. So, you know, this is not an exact science, even amongst the people who really understand the topic far better than I do. But in terms of clarity on the world stage, it is clear at this point that there are two species of yellow wagtail recognized, Western yellow wagtail and Eastern yellow wagtail. These uh, splits have been recognized at a regional level in the most recent hand guides and field guides, such as Rasmussen, Lanzerton, and Grimmett et al. Um, but many of the field guides that are used at a national level or local level perhaps predate that split, and so the splits are not yet uh, reflecting the major taxonomic change. Hold on. Sorry, I've got a lag in my computer moving forward on the screen here. My apologies. Come on. Sorry. Let me scroll up. So the um, the two forms of uh, yellow wagtail um, comprise uh, sets of subspecies, which are themselves very difficult to separate. Yellow wagtails are traditionally um, most easily identified um, when in adult male breeding plumage from late February through to July the males adopt um, a distinctive head pattern and throat pattern that is uh, very helpful to identify the subspecific forms. These come in a small set of kind of colorations. So the first is the gray headed types. And of these in Western yellow wagtail, we have on the left here, um, gray headed or Tumbergi, Motacilla flava Tumbergi. And in the Eastern yellow wagtail, we have two forms, Manchurian yellow wagtail or Macronix and Siberian yellow wagtail, Plexa. And we'll go on to talk a lot about Plexa. So bear in mind that Plexa mostly looks kind of like this um, when we're talking about Plexa as, as we move forward. There are then forms with white supercilia. And in Western yellow wagtail, we have Sykes's yellow wagtail or Bema. And in Eastern, there's the nominate form, Shuchensis. And sometimes there's a form Similima, which is identified, which breeds on the Kamchatka Peninsula, which tends to have darker ear covers. But it has a white supercilium and a yellow throat. Bema also has a white supercilium, often a paler gray head and supposedly distinct with a white uh, area on the ear covers underneath the eye. But in truth, you can see many of the other forms with small amounts of white under the eye in, in, in breeding plumages. So it isn't always as easy as this diagram would make out. In the Western form, we then have black headed yellow wagtail, which breeds further south. And I'll show you a map in a moment, um, <clears throat> which has this distinct black head. This, this appears to be a relatively easy to identify form, but actually gray-headed yellow wagtails can be extremely dark 
And you have to be very careful in identifying black-headed yellow wagtails. There's then the yellow-headed wagtail group, and this comprises in our part of the world, Lutea, uh, which comes in a variety of forms from a clear yellow head through to a green crown with a yellow supercilium. And then the very distinctive and probably the most distinctive form of the Eastern yellow wagtail group, the green headed wagtail, uh, Tyvana, um, which has these lovely dark ear coverts, bright, strong yellow supercilium and yellow throat, a very attractive looking bird. Let's see if my slide advance will work, yay. So this is not a particularly clear slide, I'm afraid, but this is a map of the distribution of the different forms. I'll talk you through it. This is from um, the, um, uh, oh, I meant to say on the previous slide, those illustrations were taken from Pivots and Wagtails of the World by Per Elstrom et al. And that's a book I would strongly recommend you look at if you're interested in this topic. The book itself is now, I think, out of print, but you can get it as a download for, um, uh, Kindle, if you're interested to read it. Um, it's a, it's, it, it is the best text available on the topic, even, but even that is still quite confusing. This map comes from, um, from that book. And if we look at our part of the world, so starting with the relatively easy forms, Macronix, the grey-headed form of Eastern Yellow Wagtail, is a relatively southern breeder. And as far as we know, it probably migrates south to uh, Southeast Asia and maybe Australia to winter. Similarly, Taiwan, the green-headed wagtail, the bird that I was just saying looks so beautiful, breeds a little further north and again is seen in, on passage in the Philippines and into Indonesia. Um, then it starts to get a little bit more complicated. The nomina race, Shushensis, um, is considered to have this huge breeding range. It actually breeds as far east as Northwestern um, Arctic Canada, um, through Alaska, uh, Chukotka area, and then through an area of um, uh, Southern Siberia, actually really quite a long way far west, well into Tibet. To the north of this, we then have the gray-headed yellow wagtail, which is mapped on this map from the uh, Pivots and Wagtails of the World book as Tumbergi throughout. However, I'll show you a, a, a next slide looking at a revision of this distribution. Um, a paper done in, where are we, 2018 by Harris et al. found birds that were allied to uh, Eastern yellow wagtail using genetics from as far west as this region here. And so this whole area of Siberia is now considered to be the breeding range of Siberian yellow wagtail or Motocilla shuchensis plexa, Eastern yellow wagtail. So Eastern Yellow Wagtail covers this area here, Trichensis, Macronix, Tyvana, this big area here. Western Yellow Wagtail covers Leucocephala, which I won't talk about much because it, it doesn't occur in, certainly in Sri Lanka. Um, Black-headed Yellow Wagtail, Feldeg, and then from a Sri Lankan perspective of particular interest, Bema, Sykes's, the one with the white supercilium and the white on the cheeks. And then this relatively small distribution of Lutea, um, which is the yellow-headed yellow wagtail. So the majority of Western yellow wagtails migrate south and west to Africa. And I spent much of my working life in Africa and saw many thousands, hundreds of thousands of Tumbergi, Bima, Lutea, particularly in Ethiopia and areas south of that. Uh, and interestingly, coming onto the calls, all those birds that I saw in Africa called like Western yellow wagtails. And I know because I tried very hard to find the first Eastern yellow wagtail in Africa and I failed. So I did look very hard at these birds. Feldegg, however, is not such a long distance migrant and um, does not normally occur uh, commonly south in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a relatively local migrant. Some of these birds, um, also migrate south and east, and Ashwin will come on to talk about this, so I won't steal his thunder. Um, but certainly Feldegg, Bima, Lutea, and Tumbergi occur in this part of, uh, of Asia, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, so I won't dwell on that now. So this is a bit of a busy map, I'm afraid, which is why it's the, the one I'm not actually talking to in, in, uh, in to explain the distribution, because there's too much kind of other stuff on this map. But, just what I wanted to do is flag the distribution of Tunbergi over here in the West, 
and Shutshensis over here in the Northeast. And th this comes from a very recent paper, which I'd recommend in Dutch birding at the end of last year, looking at the phenotypic variation, the plumage, voice, appearance of, um, and song of Eastern and Western yellow wagtails in Dutch birding. This is the Taivana distribution, Macronix, Bema over here. But notice here that the proposal is that, that Plexa is actually an introgression between Thunbergi and Schutzensis. And of particular interest is that, as I mentioned earlier, genetically, birds east of here are distinct as Eastern yellow wagtails. But many of the birds up to about here actually call like Western yellow wagtails. So you have birds that call like Western that are actually genetically Eastern, uh, which is kind of interesting. It also means that the call is a kind of one way character. Basically, if it calls like an Eastern, then it's pretty much an Eastern. Um, but it's possible that you could get some confusion in here. This is really important, particularly for those of us in Sri Lanka, because um, yellow wagtails are what they call leapfrog migrants. And that is the birds that winter further, breed furthest north, winter furthest south. And in Sri Lanka, we're at the southern extreme of the potential migration route for any birds in the system. So it's very likely that the birds we see in Sri Lanka are these birds from, from this integration area and which are considered to be plexa. So it's particularly interesting to figure out what birds we have. And I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail later. So just to return to this slide, so just to stress that this is adult males in breeding plumage, as I said, they adopt these plumages in really from about now onwards, they start to molt into these until about July, August, that sort of period. But regrettably, in the majority of the areas that we're, we're all birding in, they don't look like this. This is a selection, and I'm sure Ashwin will show you many more photographs later of what birds actually look like when we see them in our part of the world. So up in the top left here, this is a juvenile bird photographed in uh, early November. This is probably an adult bird in November. Top right, this is a bird in late February, which may well actually be into its breeding plumage. And then this bird down here is similarly adopting its breeding plumage. And you'll see that none of these really fit any of the birds in that previous slide particularly well. Even this bird here, has got a vestige of a, uh, of a supercilium. This bird with a supercilium has got a broken supercilium. So a lot of the birds we will see are, it's very, very difficult to use plumage characters to draw any major conclusions about their identities. And the main way of identifying these birds, at least separating Western from Eastern that we use in the field at this point is call. Separating the two species on call is not easy, but with practice and with experience of the two forms, it's quite distinct. However, um, one of the issues here is that anyone who um, is part of one of the range of one or of the other species is acclimatized to that particular course, so may not notice that the birds that occur locally are actually of one or other form. Uh, it's quite, quite difficult. The easiest way of separating the two birds is listening to the flight call. They make, if you listen to the yellow wagtails a lot, they make all sorts of funny little calls when they're arguing amongst each other, they're on the ground. But normally what we call the rising flight call is the best call to listen to. So this is the first call that the bird makes when it takes off the ground. And that is normally a consistent call to hear. In Western yellow wagtail, in the Northern range species, uh, a subspecies. This is a relatively clean call. Now I was going to try and play some calls for you um, from my computer here, but I, I played them back on my computer and they sounded so weak, it was very difficult to hear the differences. But just to imitate it, the um, western yellow wagtail has a nice clean pew, pew, pew call. It doesn't have any reverberation in it, no vibrato, whatsoever. And I was brought up in bird observatories in Western Europe and heard many thousands of these birds over flying on migration and know the call very, very well. By contrast, Eastern yellow wagtail has vibrato in the second element of the call. And you can see from these sonograms here, 
So just backing up, this is a clean second element in the sonograms. Here there's a clear vibrato in the second element of the, of, of the, of the sonograms. And there they go more like a type chord. Difficult to do it as a, to imitate it, but there is clear vibration in the call when you hear it. For those of you who hear citrine wagtail regularly, it's very, very similar to citrine wagtail. And certainly in Western Europe, citrine wagtails are relatively easy to identify and find because they have a very distinctive call from Western yellow wagtail and you can pick them out very easily, as indeed are the now small numbers of Eastern yellow wagtails that are being identified in the West. So this is the, um, the sonogram of one bird uh, expanded so that you can see the detail of this vibrato. Um, this is from the paper that we published. And um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, feel, I, did, I forgot to mention that majority of what um, I'm, I'm reporting here has already been published in a paper in uh, Bull BOC, the British, Bulletin of the British Ornithologist Club in January of this year. Um, co-authored by, by myself and uh, Sam Path and some other people who helped with the analyses. Um, <clears throat> the, um, this is a, the, uh, uh, a call of a bird from Sri Lanka that we reported in the paper, a single flight call. <clears throat> As I say, it's very similar to citrine wagtail, and I'm not going to try and play um, calls through the speakers on your, your computer here and now, but if you want to go and listen to recordings, I would recommend Zenocanto as a good source. And here's the link to the Zenocanto. Put your earphones on and have a listen to the calls to get, get your sense of what they sound like. You can also listen to recordings on eBird as well. There's plenty of recordings in there. One other further note, which at the moment is of relatively marginal interest to us, is that the Mediterranean forms of yellow wagtail do have buzzing flight notes. And that includes black-headed yellow wagtail which has, if you, if you hear it, it actually sounds quite different from um, Eastern Yellow Wagtail. It has a much deeper note with even more vibrato in it. But that is a potential source of confusion. Fortunately for us, the majority of the, or none of the um, several Mediterranean forms are likely to occur uh, this far east. So it's really only black-headed wagtail, which is actually quite distinctive on plumage uh, throughout the year, that's um, likely to occur um, in, in any part of South Asia. Um, and so it's not too much of an issue, thank goodness. So to, to the story, um, and as I say, this is all reported in, in the paper in, in Bull BOC. Um, <clears throat> when I first arrived in Sri Lanka in 2019, the, the first time I saw yellow wagtails in November as they arrived, I was somewhat surprised to find the first bird I heard was, was sounded like an Eastern yellow wagtail. And I got rather excited about this, thinking that this is presumably an individual rare bird. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, and it was quite an, an exciting find. I, I then went out the following morning with my, um, my microphone and everything ready to record that individual bird to find that there was a group had arrived overnight and they all called like, Eastern yellow wagtails. So I was a bit confused by this and, and did talk to some Sri Lankan ornithologists to check and see whether or not, you know, I was kind of hearing things. But I, I think it was clear that because um, uh, ornithologists in this part of the world had always heard yellow wagtails making that call and the, the literature had reported the birds as Western, that that was the association. And so it was genuinely just not a distinct thing. Uh, and it was just the luck that I knew Western yellow wagtail so well that it was it was evident. Um, we shared the the details of the calls with people such as Magnus Robb, who's one of the the experts on on separating the two forms, who confirmed that these calls fitted Eastern yellow wagtail. The birds we were seeing clearly weren't black-headed yellow wagtail; uh, they were easy to exclude on plumage. And we went on to record. Um, uh, a number of other birds around Colombo in December 2019, all of which had these rasping, vibrating calls, and none had any particular feature that was diagnostic of Western yellow wagtail. We then went on to check um, specimens, 
And in Colombo Museum, we were not able to find any birds actually that were distinctly identifiable. Um, the, uh, the birds that have been collected were in uh, winter plumages. And we did do some measurements of hind claws, which suggested that maybe there were both species present. But the measurements of hind claw uh, length is, is a difficult character to use, and we weren't sure. I also then visited the British Museum and looked at the collection there. And again, there were two birds that looked like that fitted Eastern yellow wagtail um, the, of the Shushensis race, Alaskan yellow wagtail. But again, it was difficult to say that they were 100% uh, Eastern yellow wagtails. So we kind of ended up with birds which are calling uh, fit for Eastern yellow wagtail, but it was otherwise fairly unclear. It was great to be able to have a fantastic photographic record base from Sri Lanka and the fact that uh, Sri Lankan ornithologists are so active in recording uh, photographs and posting them online proved a great resource. So we went through 71 photographs of birds online and found that there were definitely some identifiable birds um, of the Lutea race, yellow-headed wagtail, in spring plumage but the rest couldn't be assigned to either species. So at this point, um, Sampath stepped in and started working on the DNA. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk, let him talk about that later. I won't go on uh, to talk about that in any more detail here. So the conclusion from the initial work is that the call suggested that Eastern Yellow Ragtail is probably a common winter visitor to Sri Lanka. And if so, then it is probably a numerous passage migrant further north in South Asia. We suggested that birds that had not been identified to species using at least voice should be recorded as a species pair in places like eBird. And that there was a lot of further research that could be done to actually clarify uh, the status of both species in Sri Lanka and the rest of South Asia. Little was I to know that Ashwin was already well ahead of this. Um, so uh, it was really interesting to learn that independently in India, there was a lot of research already going on. Just to talk about Lutea a little bit further, um, the, um, sorry, let me just organize this a little bit. Um, the, Sampath will talk about the DNA work, but I think it's uh, quite interesting that it looks like uh, Eastern yellow wagtail is emerging as possibly the dominant form in, um, in, in Sri Lanka, certainly. And it will be great to actually get greater clarity on Western yellow actor. What evidence is there for Thunbergi occurring here? I actually have not seen a grey-headed yellow tail that calls like a Western yellow tail in Sri Lanka, having now looked at thousands of them. And similarly, black-headed yellow tail. Um, again, it'd be interesting to see if there's actually any evidence of black-headed yellow tail occurring here. It's reported in the literature, but What's the evidence for that? Lutea is also very interesting. There's some clear, nice photographs online uh, of birds with yellow heads occurring in, in Sri Lanka. Um, and we have trapped, um, and Sampath will talk about this, birds which look like um, Lutea in winter plumage with a nice bright yellow supercilium, yellow throat, even yellow emerging on the ear coverts. Um, but it seem, it's unclear exactly what the status of these birds are. I'm sure Ashwin will talk a little bit about this, but it's interesting to note that in Bangladesh, Ashwin has recorded birds that actually look like Lutea. And, and as you'll probably recall, recall, the migration route for uh, Lutea should be to the west, not up to the east through Bangladesh. So <clears throat> lots of questions there. The other thing I wanted to mention also was that um, I published a short note on socializing in Eastern Yellow Wagtails in December of last year. Um, there appears to be a uh, undescribed um, behavioral, flock behavioral uh, socializing that takes place in Yellow Wagtails in Sri Lanka that has never been recorded in Western Yellow Wagtail. This is a photograph of, of some birds doing this in, in Colombo. And this was only evident in March and April when the birds appear to be uh, coming into breeding plumage. And you will see if there's a group of more than 30 or 40 birds, 
they will suddenly contract into a really tight group, stand around with their necks stretched, and a small group then rises up in the middle and does like a dancing flight above the rest of the birds and then settles down and then they disperse. And the whole thing only lasts like one or two minutes. But it's possible that this is a unique behavioral trait to Eastern yellow wagtail and has not been recorded before. And it's something to look out for when you're looking at yellow wagtails in the region. So I'll leave it there and just um, pause on this last slide for Sampath to pick up the story from here. Thanks very much. Over to you, Sampath. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Gary. I think I'm, uh, I'm visible. Give me a second, I'll just get my... Uh... Uh, Gary, you can yeah. you guys can hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. So All right. Can... Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mojita. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, I'm on at the uh, septiculum on my way from Mena. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll uh, quickly uh, kind of go through, uh, like you know, just basically uh, uh, kind of filling uh, what uh, Gary had to say about uh, the story of. Uh, the Eastern Yellow Wagtail and the paper, and then uh, I will uh, I will log into my computer while I'm talking here, and uh, I'll show you some of the uh, some of our recent work that uh, again Gary mentioned uh, that uh, just before uh, COVID in uh, 2020 in March, uh, late February and March, uh, we've done some work uh, follow up work to this work uh, that uh, got published. Uh, at uh, bulletin, the British uh, BOU bulletin. Uh, so I will show that. Uh, maybe I'll wait uh, Ashwin to finish his stuff and then show you a small video clip and uh, and uh, and, uh, and the future work. Uh, to uh, to continue what uh, what uh, Gary uh, uh, stopped. Uh, so. Uh, Let's uh, sit case. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, a peculiar uh, bird or group of birds uh, observed uh, with, uh, with odd vocalization, and uh, there were samples. Uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, we didn't catch them, uh, so Gary managed to collect some uh, fecal matter, uh, fresh droppings, and. Uh, and then from that, he was going to ask it. And we do a uh, I can't see my video. I'm just trying to get my video. Ah, here we go. Right. So, so from the, uh, sorry, I'm on my, on, a, on the move, uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a roadside uh, spot where I can get a little bit of uh, uh, better internet. So, anyway, so. Coming back, so the uh, so the fresh droppings uh, were used, and from the droppings, uh, uh, basic uh, region in the mitochondrial genome been identified. The idea was to uh, locate uh, to kind of cluster uh, the, the, the several birds from this uh, cluster that Gary had observed onto uh, already known uh, western cluster onto the or you know, Eastern cluster. It's a kind of a cluster mapping or the pattern matching. Uh, we can use genetics in this case. We can use uh, vocalization in this context to understand already known, uh, you know, when you, when you know already known clusters uh, to uh, compare the unknown birds in this case from Colombo uh, to uh, and get their sequences and then to uh, uh, match them with against uh, Eastern and Eastern uh, sequences. Uh, in this case, uh, real gene regions from the control regions. Uh, a very small region, about 231 uh, bases, uh, slightly smaller compared to most of the comparisons that we use in the context. Normally, we use about 1,000 to 2,000, or sometimes even longer. But when you use uh, uh, passive sampling, like uh, uh, 
uh, fecal sampling or uh, fallen feathers, um, DNA from fallen feathers. Uh, the DNA tend to be more fragmented. So to, uh, uh, to, to tackle that problem, uh, what we do, we you know, for much smaller sequences. Uh, would that be a problem? Uh, it can be a problem uh, if you have, a, uh, uh, if, if the match is not uh, 100%. But in this particular case, so we had a shorter fragment uh, so that we got a, a kind of a, a continuous section from the region called control region of the mitochondrial genome. Mitochondrial genome is better for this sort of work because for recently stripped taxa, uh, recently diverged, highly diverging uh, taxa, uh, like especially in birds where you have lost species. That means they are diverging and the, the, the different parts better to use uh, much more like regions in the genome that has high divergence rate like mitochondria and control region is particularly uh, a good region for uh, bird taxonomy uh, most of the, uh, uh, the yellow wagtail uh, work uh, done by the authorities uh, like uh, perlstrom and the group uh, in, uh, in the Europe, uh, they use the control region. So, so we also use the control region, shorter region, because and uh, then we compare those uh, against the Western, about four subspecies of Western yellow vectors and uh, six subspecies, uh, uh, six different populations uh, representing uh, two senses uh, in the Eastern class. And uh, what we see, uh, the, the two birds that we uh, compare against uh, Western and Eastern uh, clusters showed a 100% match. Uh, even though the, the locations are smaller, uh, shorter, just 230, we had a bootstrap support of 100%, a complete agreement uh, of uh, the two birds with uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, Eastern yellow vector, the uh, the Motacilla uh, two senses. Uh, so, uh, would that be uh, like so? But we don't. We haven't. Uh, uh, we haven't had the power to uh, further and uh, to uh, uh, nail down whether it's uh, it's the two senses nominate or uh, Tyrana and uh, uh, Macron and all. However, uh, the uh, of the compared uh, groups. Uh, it is uh, fairly confidently uh, supported the fact that the two birds are the two birds that uh, Gary had collected uh, uh, fecal matter are from Eastern Yellow Vector. Uh, so, so is that uh, is that a, a, a like uh, the smoke uh, like uh, uh, the, the, the 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 golden bullet uh, or the, 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 the is that a kind of a conclusive evidence? Uh, I'm sorry, it's very loud here. I'm near a Kotu uh, hut and a and a and no, a sorry, so, uh, no worries, you are good, right? So good. All right, good. good. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so so is that uh, is that uh, is that the the smoking gun uh, that uh, we would uh, uh, look for to uh, identify uh, our birds as uh, Eastern yellow wagtails? No. But uh, what it, it what it means? It means that. Uh, uh, it supports genetically, it's uh, conclusively uh, supporting uh, the, the vocalization, the best Eastern uh, vocalization that uh, we hear in uh, our birds uh, in Colombo. And uh, it, it opens up uh, new avenues to compare the Western with the Eastern ones. And, uh, and, uh, and on top of that, as, uh, as Gary showed in, in the, the, the second map, we are that the Thumbergy, the, the, the northern, uh, northern uh, subarctic uh, and uh, northern boreal uh, uh, that uh, spreads across the, uh, the, the northern plains uh, from, uh, from the uh, Western Europe all the way to the far eastern Russia. And, uh, and there's a boreal breed uh, that spreads from uh, slightly Southern uh, far east, far eastern Russia to uh, to the boreal forest on into the uh, Caspian Sea, uh, and uh, the, the merger between that uh, which uh, group uh, and 
so the, the complexity that arise with the plumage, the intermediate in, uh, plumage uh, patterns uh, that uh, one would expect in the in the middle of this uh, thumbergy and the uh, and the and the uh, 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 ready. Uh, the the complexities arise uh, in the middle of the uh, in this middle area in the station. Uh, so the uh, so to get a, a better traction of this uh, problem, the, the 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 comparisons of parental uh, eastern yellow wagtails in this case frequency and comparisons of parental uh, western uh, yellow wagtails in this case uh, the uh, the uh, lutea or or thunbergi would be useful uh, uh, for uh, to get uh, a better traction actually uh, for the for the for the uh, question in hand so with that uh, with a sh very short gene region with a single gene region but with a 100% agreement uh, of 100% good support uh, using a generally uh, the, the the top uh, uh, phylogenetic uh, tools available. We've used uh, the maximum life fluid framework uh, in VaxML, uh, which is the, the generally accepted uh, uh, the tool for this sort of short uh, uh, sequence alignments. Uh, so we use the top uh, available uh, tools uh, with the best models in hand. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, and we came up with this uh, phylogenetic tree that uh, we see that, yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, shows that uh, the our birds, the two Sri Lankan birds that uh, sequence uh, fall well within uh, uh, So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a strong support uh, for the claim that our uh, Eastern-like uh, uh, calls of uh, the Colombo birds are actually from the Eastern Yellow uh, Gary. Over to you. I will I will show you some uh, some basic uh, uh, nice video and some basic uh, details about uh, the next step of this study. As uh, Gary mentioned, we sample uh, birds uh, in Colombo. We record them. We uh, took blood samples uh, uh, from uh, from their uh, brachial vein and detailed measurements of molt of uh, plumage patterns, uh, photographs against standard background. I will talk about it uh, uh, at the end, uh, tail end of this uh, discussion. Over to you guys. Thanks okay. very much, Sampath. So I think that's the kind of story so far um, that we have. Um, seems like a, an emerging strong body of evidence from both the calls, the appearance of the birds that we're seeing, and the genetics that there are at least some eastern yellow wagtails present and from what we can tell from calls it seems like the vast majority of birds are eastern yellow wagtails in sri lanka so um uh perhaps i should do i hand back to you Modita? will you uh, as chair or we go directly to ashwin yeah, we can uh, we can go to Ashwin. So uh, Ashwin, uh, thank you very much again for joining with us uh, today to share your uh, uh, experience from India. So uh, without further ado, I think uh, we can start uh, your presentation. Where maybe let me. Uh, yeah, I'm you. able to share my screen, and uh, thanks, Murita, and thanks, Gary and Sampath. Uh, really wonderful to hear the Sri Lankan story. And uh, we hope uh, we can repeat some of that here as well. I'll take, uh, take you all through the Indian story now, which uh, coincided uh, surprisingly with the Sri Lankan story, but uh, was a little different. So I'll start off with um, just a map of uh, yellow actives across Eurasia, uh, migrating down to the tropics. And uh, as you see, they in the summer, they're all across Eurasia. And uh, you have some of them wintering in Africa, some of them wintering in South Asia, and then Southeast Asia. And it just so happens that uh, South Asia is right at the center of uh, this range and uh, the most complicated because further west of South Asia, it's all Western. Further east, it's all Eastern. And we get a mix of everything. Uh, 
the photo that uh, you see here is of uh, Feldek, uh, the easiest or uh, one of the Mediterranean black-headed forms, which is uh, quite easy to identify, but not always, of course, uh, as uh, Gary explained. So the forms that we have in India, again, I won't get into that too much, and I will not talk much about the identification because uh, that's already been spoken about. But I take you to the uh, Indian yellow tail story, which is just uh, in its infancy and uh, has a long way to go. So this um, black tail that you see here uh, on this grassy field was uh, photographed in uh, Maguri Bill in Assam in 2016, December 2016. And uh, this was um, one of my first trips to the Northeast after I became aware of Northeast of India, after I became aware of the existence of Eastern Yellow Wagtail. So uh, in India, we just do not think about, uh, or we did not think about the possibility of Eastern Yellow Wagtail anywhere. And I must thank Ramit for uh, mentioning this possibility to me. So when I went in 2016, December, I looked out for yellow wagtails that had long thrombotheliums and really dark, unbroken ear covers. So this is what I'm looking out for. And um, in winter, in South Asia, yellow wagtails look far from, uh, they look nothing like their breeding plumages and they're, they're quite confusing. And I happened to find this one bird that at least matched uh, to some extent the textbook definition of uh, the subspecies Tushinensis. And uh, then we discussed this with a few people uh, and uh, then looked at certain other photos that people had taken from uh, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And um, we realized that Eastern yellow tail, which was thought to be hypothetical to, the, to South Asia at that point, was not so because there were some clear birds. And at that point, we are still under the impression that this uh, species was a rarity. So this was published. And um, all we knew then was the Eastern Yellow Wagtail did occur in some part of India. And then we forgot about Eastern Yellow Wagtail for a couple of years. So during that period, I spent some time in Europe. And uh, as Gary explained, what we hear in South India just so happens to be mostly Eastern, which I'll come to. And which is why Yellow Wagtails elsewhere in the country did not really uh, you know, did not sound like something different. And we heard a combination across the country. So when I spent some time in Europe uh, and tried to become familiar with uh, some of these calls, um, I was able to pick out Eastern calls a little better. So when I went to Bangladesh in uh, December 2019 uh, to an island, to a group of islands called uh, Nijum Dweep, and there were these vast grassy fields uh, Nijum Dweep is famous for hosting a small population of wintering spoonbill sandpipers, uh, but there are also these vast grassy fields with cattle that were filled with yellow wagtails. So I went behind these yellow wagtails and uh, listened to them and photographed some of them, recorded them and uh, spent a lot of time listening to them. And every single call I heard over uh, 10 days in Bangladesh, that part of Bangladesh, they were all Eastern type calls. The plumage is varied, as you can see. There were birds uh, like the top left one that that looked um, more like the nominate uh, and the bottom left one. But there were these really confusing ones in the what you see in the top right, which at that point I thought was Taiwana, but uh, not quite. It doesn't fit Taiwana for many reasons, as I found out later. But it gave out an Eastern call. The one at the bottom right also gave out an Eastern call. So there's a wide range of plumages, all giving out harsh calls. Uh, so that, uh, I thought that if there were so many Eastern yellow wagtails in uh, wintering in Bangladesh, uh, maybe we should find out more, at least in other parts of Northeast India. And bird watchers in India from uh, West Bengal, uh, Sandeep Das, Sandeep Bishwas, Ajay Kumar Don, and many more, it showed an immediate interest to document yellow wagtails and find out more, because this was, um, this, uh, was an interesting challenge to everyone. Uh, Bangladesh, uh, Seth Milan, Zabar, Ansari in particular, but uh, many others as well. Uh, Vikas, Mahati, and Gajamohan Raj from Tamil Nadu recorded and photographed a number of yellow wagtails. Uh, a number of people from Karnataka, uh, Telangana, 
Kerala, and many other bird watchers. We started discussing this on our local bird watching groups. Uh, the possibilities of yellow eastern yellow wagtails. A number of calls were shared. We even had a specific WhatsApp group in Tamil Nadu that was dedicated to eastern yellow wagtails between three of us. So uh, you know, a lot of this happened on WhatsApp, sharing calls, all of us learning from each other, finding out what was there, and uh, a number of calls were recorded. Uh, all the calls from West Bengal, most of the calls from Tamil Nadu. um all of the calls from northeast india um and uh, some parts of kerala karnataka etc they all ended up being um, eastern type calls a large number of them, number of them so we started slowly finding out more through the calls than plumages for a while we decided that we we're not going to look at how they look we are just going to record calls and see what they sound like so we found out that so many birds in india at least the eastern uh, belt of india coming down to the south they all had eastern type calls and they were all likely eastern yellow wagtails so we uh, we identified them as eastern yellow wagtails we started looking out more for plumages as well and at least uh, in uh, feb march april there were some very distinctive plumages that uh, we found in a number of these places and uh, so the story was unraveling uh in uh, tamil nadu there was a really nice uh, in chennai there was a really nice article published in uh, a newspaper uh, hindu newspaper where um, about yellow wagtail which is uh, you know not a very common thing to feature in newspapers so eastern yellow wagtail the first one for chennai tamil nadu at that point again we still did not know how common it was or how abundant it was but it was it made the news and uh, there's a i think you sh uh, should all read this article it has uh, it's really nicely written with uh, with an interesting analogy then in uh, so far most of the yellow wagtails had been uh, nominate types or gray headed types which i'll get into but uh, from kerala uh, pravin photographed what um, many people thought was a uh, taiwana so we now had multiple subspecies uh, wintering in um, in india so south india eastern parts northeast and uh, in karnataka so we we thought this was maybe in the southern parts and uh, perhaps in uh, the eastern parts but this was in almost in central to north karnataka um had gone and um, i found really large numbers of uh, wintering wagtails but here there were clear western type calls as you see in the bottom two uh, that uh, the uh, last but one uh, is from bangalore and then there were clear western calls you see it doesn't have the rasping the the uh, you know the noisy quality that uh, eastern has and the top three calls uh, two of them are from uh, west bengal and the top one is again from that part of karnataka which is again a clear western uh, type call and uh, this is what that bird looked like Uh, with dark ear coverts and uh, long thin supercilium uh, somewhat fitting uh, nominate eastern yellow wagtail and uh, slowly we started understanding more about its distribution this is the current distribution which is far from uh, resolved of eastern yellow wagtail but the most interesting uh, insights came from this part of west bengal the western part of west bengal uh which includes asansol uh, the uh, where uh, bird ajay, ajay kumar don uh, where he uh, started getting interested in documenting yellow wagtails and ended up documenting multiple subspecies of uh, western and eastern yellow wagtail in uh, identifiable plumage and uh, east of this there were very few documented uh, very few photos that were clearly of western yellow, yellow wagtail but over here and just a little just around this region multiple photos of western yellow wagtail also started emerging and i'll take you through some of them and of eastern uh so uh, this is a reasonably typical uh, bima and uh, this is uh, bima is what we also get uh, commonly in the south uh, in uh, the bangalore region even um, actually in most of the peninsula and i think maybe also in sri lanka uh, so this um, individual is really distinctively plumaged uh, the ear coverts as you see are quite gray not very dark not as dark as the crown and you see this uh, this stripe that gary spoke about uh, below the eye 
uh, the suborbicular stripe, which is again really prominent here. And this is variable, as you said. But um, in uh, some of the Eastern firms that at least I am used to, it's not doesn't get so prominent. And this is something you can make out as they develop uh, breeding plumage, perhaps. Um, Bima or Lutia, again, uh, a Western type. So all of these birds are documented with vocalizations, which is how we were able to uh, be sure. So these are birds that gave out Western type calls, uh, either Bima, Lutia, maybe still developing some yellow, hard to say, but the, the crown, as you see, is um, has a slight tinge of green coming in. So um, not so sure. Uh, a more traditional Lutia, perhaps. So this is in, um, again, in that part of West Bengal, the west eastern edge of the Chota Nagpur Plateau. Uh, and uh, more traditional Eastern types. So here you have a nominate Eastern, Tushinensis, with nice uh, black, uh, dark black ear coverage, darker than the crown, along supercilium, and uh, giving out uh, clear Eastern calls. And another um, Eastern type bird, Eastern type plumage with Eastern calls. Uh, what could be a Taiwana? I'm not sure. Again, with Eastern calls very dark yorker words and a broad yellow supercilium uh, uh, broadening behind the eye. Again, maybe Taiwana. And this mysterious type, uh, which I also showed in, um, uh, from I showed a photo from Bangladesh. And uh, the type green-headed again, but uh, with a thin supercilium, if at all, it doesn't fit Taiwana, doesn't fit uh, any of the, um, any of the, known taxa or the known plumages. So maybe some undescribed taxon of Eastern somewhere, but again, recorded and uh, the calls are Eastern. And uh, the dreaded gray-headed form, which is found all over India, all over Sri Lanka, uh, a very common uh, plumage around India. And this could be anything. It could be Western yellow wagtail, Tunbaji, it could be Macronix, it could be Plexa, this form that, um, that aligns with Eastern, but again looks exactly like the others. And I recently read a paper where uh, they had, uh, there's another un currently undescribed grey-headed form in uh, Western China, which again seems to look identical. And uh, there are various grey-headed forms, all potentially converging uh, in the Indian Peninsula and in Sri Lanka all require documentation and, uh, you know, further study. So then when this, uh, when we started finding out that these uh, gray-headed forms could be Eastern as well and uh, were predominantly Eastern in some parts, I started looking out more closely at these and so did many other bird watchers. Uh, so this is an observation from uh, central West Bengal, from Malda along the Ganga, where again, huge numbers of uh, yellow wagtails winter along um, grassy riverbanks. Uh, so if you look at my notes here, uh, heard intermittently before a large flock started moving around in the evening, all birds I saw had dark unbroken ear covers without a suborbicular stripe and a prominent long supercilium. Didn't hear a single western type call. Saw some Tunbaji types though. So now again, there is that, um, there is that doubt, you know, about what these birds are, because all the calls are hearing are uh, Eastern types, but you're seeing many birds that have uh, what we have grown up calling uh, Tunbaji. And uh, this is in uh, Sundarbans in West Bengal. Again, a number of uh, gray-headed forms, all sounding like Eastern, not a single Western type call. And this is finally in Bangalore. And this was a big surprise to me at that point. Uh, I still thought at least large numbers of Eastern yellow wagtails were maybe restricted to the East Coast or maybe Northeast India. And uh, this observation is, is um, of over 100 yellow wagtails, almost all giving out Eastern type calls. And, and the la a large majority of these actually having gray-headed plumages. And this is really similar to uh, what's been found in Sri Lanka. Uh, gray-headed birds largely being uh, giving out Eastern type calls. And that appears to be the case even in South India. Uh, around Bangalore. But of course, we also get uh, more, um, we get nominate plumages with uh, the superceliums. 
so what do we know so far uh, we know that across uh, the eastern part of the peninsula and in sri lanka uh, eastern yellow wagtails are common winter visitors uh, now the question is how abundant are they what is the proportion what's the proportion of eastern to western in bangalore we certainly get uh, good numbers of bima western yellow wagtail lutia even leucocephala is a rare visitor and uh, reasonable numbers of felidae so we have a good uh, influx of western but also eastern the gray headed forms seem to be more eastern aligned and of course the nominate uh, uh, tushinensis uh, birds in kerala uh, taiwan has been um, documented and uh, also in parts of northeast india so maybe these birds are uh, are more abundant than we think they are but there's a huge gap a large part of uh, the peninsula we still don't know which uh, forms winter and we still don't know um, whether eastern occurs at all so uh, i would say bird watchers in um, in central india in western india north india uh, document yellow wagtail calls because most plumages are going to be inconclusive photograph and record them in march april when they are likely to develop some sort of breeding plumage and uh, gray headed birds can be western or eastern record them to find out which if not uh, when you are reporting them um, you can always use a slash so as i already said multiple times gray headed forms from southern and eastern india appear to be eastern and not western and uh, the story is just beginning and i think with uh, with the work that's going on in sri lanka and uh, hopefully we can uh, begin some uh, genetic examinations in india as well in the near future this uh, i think we're going to find out a lot more about where these yellow wagtails uh, where one yellow wagtail ends and the other begins or to be all are they all together we don't know and uh, just to finish um, a lot of this in india was uh, speculation we had uh, been recording calls we had looked at these uh, we had looked at these photos and we had no idea about the work that was going on in sri lanka alongside and it was actually uh, it was really um, we we felt really happy when we heard about the sri lankan work which actually gave little more support to what we had been uh, speculating to an extent uh, not entirely speculating but it still was so big a leap in knowledge that it was really good to have some um, support from another region which was which got the same yellow wagtails so and uh, thank you everyone for giving this opportunity um, modita gary sampath and everyone else and i think um, yellow wagtails are a group which uh, require all of us to be involved with uh, to find out where they are and uh, which forms winter where and so thank you for setting this up yeah thank you very much ashwin that's very very interesting and yeah i think uh, uh, gary and uh, dr sampath and all must be feeling very happy because the, uh, because we both of, uh, of 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 these groups have traveled parallel doing the same thing in two different location and and uh, seems to have uh, seems to be having the same result it's pretty cool isn't it uh, so uh, yeah and uh, thank you very much ashwin again uh, for uh, don't, i mean uh, for putting out your time uh, for this uh, talk so uh, i think we basically covered uh, uh, the, the the lecture part uh, of our talk so we we have we can have a we can start the discussion now uh, because i think that's uh, pretty good and if anyone is having uh, questions you can uh, put it in the chat uh, and uh, yeah and uh, yeah now we can start the discussion and right off uh, uh, mike is uh, having some thoughts so yeah you can you can add stuff sir hello everybody um Mike, thanks for letting me join in from England, unfortunately, now. Um, uh, it's brilliant, the stuff you've um, all gone through. Um, as Ashwin and Gary knows as well, we've been sort of looking at yellow wagtails confused for many years. And actually, for me personally, I'm a bit like Gary, and I 
uh, first looked at them about 20 years ago. I was lucky to spend quite a lot of time in Israel where in the spring you'd have lots of different nice breeding plumaged wagtails and we were always trying to work out subspecies even before we suspected there was multiple species. Um, there's a couple of things I think from field observations that um, I don't know, add in that actually makes it more complicated than I think Ashwin and Gary have already suggested there. Um, it's interesting looking at some of the photos, particularly the, the birds that Ashwin is showing there. But one thing I think we mentioned, Gary mentioned that it's breeding males you want to look at mostly to get a chance of identifying them well on plumage. And I think you should probably assume most of those pictures Ashwin put were not males or were either immature males or females. So when we're looking at plumage variations, particularly unless it is in sort of late March, April, May, um, sexing them is really difficult um, and aging them is really difficult. So you've got extra variabilities coming in there. The other thing um, that I was thinking of is, um, I remember Gary saying, I don't, have you got Bima in Sri Lanka? Um, you want me to answer that? <laughs> well, if there's a quick answer. <laughs> so I need to pick my words really carefully here. So, um, so there are there are no specimens in the Colombo Museum, and I don't see any specimens in the British Museum of birds that you could ascribe to Bima. I have seen one photograph of one bird, which is clearly Bima, but there was no sound recording of that bird. I have seen one bird in the distance myself that I thought might have been Bima, but weren't able to get a sound recording. But I think Moditer in the last week, you saw a bird that you thought might be Bima and you got some sound recordings, but we haven't had a chance to analyze them yet. My uh, suspicion no, is that Bima is definitely present in Sri Lanka, but probably in very small numbers. That would be my mm -hmm. estimate. Because um, it's interesting that actually, at least around the Bangalore area, it's fairly regular. Um, yeah. So um, that was the, that was I think where one of the complications comes in if you you're trying to listen for calls a little bit is that generally they're in mixed flocks, so you've got multiple birds, and in at least in our case around Bangalore, that's including birds such as Bima, which is western, as well as the potentially easterns. Um, and I, I I mean I, I know I personally struggle on some of the calls a bit through the variation, but it's quite difficult to record birds when they're in a flock because yeah. you want a flight call. So which birds are you recording? Do you know that you're recording the bird you were looking at, for example, <clears throat> um, which is not so easy. Um, and also, I mean, we talked briefly at the felled egg, which again, we get a little bit, and I think mostly in sort of April time, but has a buzzier, raspier call. So again, unless you clear which bird you're looking at and which bird is calling, it's quite difficult. You've got a mix there all the time. Um, and so you're not, that lovely pure um, Flavissima flava call that you demonstrated at the start, Gary, is not really something we hear. We're hearing Western birds that don't really have quite such a lovely different call. You're hearing more of a felled egg or beamer yeah. really not quite that close. So I mean, it is interesting, Mike, that, you know, my experience of, of beamer in Africa uh, mm -hmm. was they do have, they all have lovely, clear Flavissima like beautiful okay. clean calls mm. um, to my disappointment because <laughs> I was trying to find Eastern Yellow Wagtail. Um, never got anywhere near it. Um, so mm. and and the 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 texts are um, generally quite ambivalent about the calls of both Bima and Lutea when it comes to the possibility of them making Eastern type calls. So it would be really interesting to get a set of calls of the Bema types. And I think even more the Lutea types. I'm absolutely fascinated by the Lutea yeah. green headed type birds, like those birds you I saw think, in Bangladesh, Ashwin. So we, um, in, um, in central Karnataka, I happened to come across a flock which contained uh, Bema types and Eastern types. And I, I got some recordings of the Bema types after a lot of trouble. But uh, the calls over there and in Bangalore, the ones I've been able to isolate that are coming from Bhima appear to be Western type calls and uh, yeah. quite, quite different. And maybe, maybe they have more variation, but I think, I think, I think yeah. Mm, I think that's right. Because if we are looking out for calls, if you're listening for a raspia call, you hear one that just isn't raspia. I think we've generally assumed those are probably the Bhimas in the flock, um, at least around the Bangalore area. Um, yeah, and, and, and the other thing we think of yeah, and regarding mm -hmm. the beamers that I Bima I saw very recently, the one the photo I sent you to, uh, to Gary, and even on that bird it was fairly isolated, but 
uh, after recording, I noted that there are some rasping calls of that particular bird also. But there are also uh, softer calls coming out from that same bird. So we, I, 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 we are not done with the calls yet. Uh, we have still have to analyze it. But clearly, there shows some. Uh, there seems to be some variation of that particular bird. Yeah, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of variations you, you do get, and then Gary you mentioned this again, that, that the sort of flight takeoff call is the one you want to listen for, but clearly when a bird takes off, it'll often give you a little bit of raspier call, but then when it's moving into regular flight, it's not so raspy, it's a slightly purer call um, in regular flight, so it's a more explosive on a takeoff, I think. Um, and there's one final thing I was going to mention, which is probably which is interesting that Modita made the comment he did. I know in Western Europe, there have been one or two uh, Eastern yellow wagtails um, from DNA evidence that have been recorded giving raspier calls, but not always. And they've been giving multiple call types. So they've been giving the purer, more Western sounding calls. Uh, I think there was a bird in Ireland a few years ago, and I know there's been one or two others, I think, where they've got multiple calls that have the variation. So it seems to be a bit, I think, if you, if you hear the raspy sort of call, that seems to be eastern and the westerns aren't giving that probably the beamers aren't giving that but maybe not um but if you do hear of a, a more western purer call that doesn't necessarily rule out an eastern yeah complicated just, isn't it <laughs> just it is a bit complicated isn't it it's fun it's complicated <laughs> but uh, but i think it's something we'll have focus on it would surprise me we you know if we're, we're careful and methodical about this that we can we can actually kind of get greater clarity. I know that, that um, Sampath was was speaking earlier about you know where we go next, and and I think you know what Ashwin was just laying out as the fact that we need to be quite methodical about what we do, and we need to be very careful in the field to make sure that when we identify these things, we actually hear and ide ideally record the call and get a photograph of the bird. That's yeah. right, and how you make sure that's the same bird. I remember yeah, that's um, a challenge. I remember we hearing... a lot of birds that are just slash. You know, we didn't get that's the right. evidence. We yeah. don't know what they were. Um, I remember and, a year and, ago with uh, yeah. I was birding. In... Yeah, mm. since you have uh, much experience with the uh, Western forms, so so now we are hearing like uh, possible Eastern birds making some somewhat uh, softer calls. Have you heard the other other way? That uh, Western yellow wagtail make rasping calls here and there, in 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 more in the usual Western areas. I've not heard that mentioned by anybody, except for the fact that people do talk about when you we just say Western here, but there is still a, a bit of a northwestern and southwestern group. So the the Flavicima uh, yeah. flavors yeah, yeah. to be much yeah, yeah. purer, but there are some from southern Europe, and and then you get into this Feldegg type area. Where the calls are uh, a little bit different again. Yes, certainly my experience from Africa was that um, sub, certainly sub-Saharan Africa, um, all the birds call with lovely clean calls, and that includes okay. yeah. uh, flava types, clavicema types, and then in Eastern Africa, um, lutias, uh, beamers. Um, uh, you know, in 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 great numbers, and and I never heard anything. So I mean, I'm I'm intrigued as to the possibility that some of the birds on the eastern parts of the ranges of Lutea and Bima, which migrate south and east to the subcontinent, um, might be you know introgressing. Um, with populations of eastern yellow wagtail and therefore have calls that are perhaps less clear because certainly the luteas that I've heard here um, are very iffy. <laughs> you know, there are a number of birds I've heard that's... Guys, go ahead. Guys, go, go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm just sharing something while you're talking. No problem. Um, that, that definitely sound like Eastern yellow wagtails, um, right, right. you know. So I'm, I, and that could be. I think, as you probably know, there's been some very nice work, detailed work done on the range and distribution of lutea, published. I think it was last year um, by this Italian guy whose name now escapes me, but really very, very detailed stuff, showing that the range of lutea basically has two subpopulations: one west of the Urals, 
which is where the bulk of the birds occur, and probably those are all the birds that go to Africa. But then there's a very dispersed eastern part of the range that goes right the way into northern Kazakhstan. Um, and presumably, those are the birds that come our way. Um, but, you know, we're talking vast distances here. This is like, uh, you know, 1,500 kilometers between, across the breadth of the range. And these birds are at relatively low densities and actually intermixing with other forms of yellow wagtail. It's perfectly possible that, you know, there's some sort of genetic introgression taking place in those sorts of circumstances that might affect the way in which the call share takes place. The other possibility, which is also, I mean, particularly flagged by your really interesting observations, Ashwin, is that there's just another completely different form of lutea, another yellow-headed wagtail that, you know, breeds somewhere, <laughs> kind of in the middle of nowhere, I don't know where, um, and migrates down through Bangladesh and through eastern uh, India and into Sri Lanka. And it's just a as yet undescribed form. Um, you know, either of those, I think, are interesting possibilities to, as you said, Ashwin, speculate, um, because I think they're, you know, either are possible. Very interesting. Sorry, was, uh, I'll, add, I'll, I'll add my two cents uh, to what uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike and uh, Gary was talking, and also uh, some of the stuff that Ashwin uh, mentioned uh, probably before before the discussion. Where the probably the western this part uh, this bit of I get, uh, uh, hello. Yes, you guys can hear me. You said. Right, so this part, uh, you mentioned that uh, not very, uh, bit of a gray, and uh, Bangladesh, it's a bit uh, mostly Eastern, and uh, the Western Sri Lanka is mostly Eastern. Uh, so I wanted to add a small uh, something on this, uh, something that Gary earlier mentioned, where this probably this area is Plexa, uh, or the, the, the this integration of Tongaji coming into, uh, uh, contact with uh, uh, two senses uh, because these ideas of these subspecies came from European sources. Uh, you know, you when you look into the extremes of a continuum, uh, sometimes uh, the like Sri Lanka or southern India, where the wintering populations might be coming from the, the, the middle of this parental so called extreme or parental forms. Uh, so, what's two small uh, uh, points uh, towards that? Uh, one is that uh, there is a, a recent uh, record of uh, insectivore uh, uh, barn swallows, a tagged barn swallow in the central China, migrated through my Bangladesh along the eastern coast to Sri Lanka. That's one. The other thing uh, is the uh, some of our findings as well as uh, the, uh, the overwhelming uh, findings in the tagged bird from Boreal Central Asia shows that Indus Valley can be a, a kind of a, a, one of the main routes uh, for the birds to South India. And then uh, the other uh, like probable uh, other source would be the, uh, the, the, the Central uh, Western uh, Asian birds coming into uh, uh, South Asia from this. So, it, so depending on the uh, the routes that these birds would follow, uh, their ranges would uh, uh, like come from uh, different uh, populations, uh, like the true eastern uh, two senses, or even Taiwana, if it is a bit south, uh, to uh, the parental uh, two senses, and then uh, the probable plexa or the interest uh, populations to uh, the true Lutia, uh, Bima, the Western Western cluster uh, that comes from here. So it will be very very interesting, uh, especially Ashwin and uh, you know uh, Northern cousins uh, uh, to look into uh, these uh, these uh, populations uh, to understand a bit more about uh, the origins and uh, and uh, South India and Sri Lanka being a, a funnel. Uh, maybe it's a kind of a mixing point, a point of multiple populations from all these uh, different uh, uh, gray areas as well as parental forms uh, coming in. So it will be very, very interesting uh, for, uh, to explore this uh, further. Uh, my battery is dying, so I will show something that Mike showed as well, and then so I don't have to rely on my computer. Uh, I will uh, uh, 
uh, uh, close this and then uh, show you some uh, small uh, video that one of my students uh, recently uh, prepared uh, just so that it gives the uh, kind of the very thing that uh, uh, Gary uh, mentioned earlier, the next step of what we are doing here in Sri Lanka. Uh, what I have to do, I'll, I'll go to, I'll go to, uh, okay. This is a, a video that uh, I, you guys can hear me, okay? Can you see the video? Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll show you. It's 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 some like one of my students uh, done it for fun, but this is the the next step that we are doing in Sri Lanka. I think uh, maybe it will be interesting to see if we can uh, recreate this in India as well. Here it is. All right, that's all. That was a kind of a fun, uh, fun. Uh, Unfortunately, project. We, we, we didn't hear the sound. It's much, oh, you didn't hear the sound. Uh, no, much pretty cooler than with the sound because I have uh, I've seen it. Too. Yeah, you've seen the sound. Like, how can I? How can I make it uh, with sound? Uh, shall yeah. I share? I think I I think you have to make it uh, uh, optimized for uh, in the share button, uh, Modita. Can you optimize it for video uh, sound as well? You can just do it uh, in the right hand side uh, arrow in the share uh, green button. Yeah. Is it done? Shall I get? Shall I get the? You didn't miss anything by not hearing the sound, but I'll, 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 I'll just 40 seconds. Okay, or, or else I'll get the, I'll get the host, I'll reclaim the host. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll reclaim the host and I'll get the, uh, uh, the all participants. Okay. Uh, okay, I will now share it again. Uh, uh, sorry. Much, uh, much cooler I'm in not, the time. Yeah. I'm not bored, okay. Optimize for video clip, all right. I will redo it. Uh, sorry, guys, if I'm uh, boring, I'm making it a little bit. Uh, uh, all right, here it is. So, I think you can see it. Uh, maybe the battery went. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Oh, well, it lasted. So, so, what can I add to that? Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. It's much cooler Hello. in the sun. Uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. Are we having yeah question? Yeah. Uh, my question. Uh, I'm Sushmita. I'm from Zerasai NRC, Andaman Nicobar Islands. So my question is that. Uh, how many species of bacteria are found in Andaman? As far as we know at the moment, um, or whatever calls have been recorded, it's all Eastern. Yes, Eastern. Uh, but we never know. So, um, so do record and uh, let's see. Maybe Western does reach there. Because whenever uh, when I explore, I see only two species of bacteria only. That's Eastern yellow bacteria and grey bacteria. So, is there any reported? Yes. So, eastern yellow wagtail, grey wagtail, and citrine wagtail should be, and white wagtail. All of these should be there. Thank you so much, sir. Thank yeah. you. So, so one thing interesting, Gary, there is a recording of a Tunbaji from Gujarat on uh, Zenocanto. Uh, do take a look, all of you. Uh, it uh, sounded like sounds like Western to me. Uh, but the sonogram is uh, not very conclusive. 
at least i'm not able to make out so uh, worth checking out and uh, during this entire eastern elevator examination that happened in west bengal there was one somebody who photographed a ring bird um that uh, looked eastern and uh, the ring said almaty kazakhstan so we tried to trace uh, we tried to trace it back we tried to find out more about it but uh, we weren't able to do so so those photos are still around and imagine that somebody got a photo of what was written on a yellow wagtail ring <laughs> so so ashwin which subspecies was that with the ring on uh it was that it was the weird green headed one i so it was a lutea type lutea into taiwana into some it, and and sorry where exactly was the bird in india in um around calcutta okay all right yeah okay Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's great. Very interesting evidence. Yeah, Very through Kazakhstan into Calcutta. Quite, yeah, okay. really interesting. <laughs> Fascinating. So I'm not sure if Sampath is still able to. Uh, I think they're not. Um, but one of the things I think he was going to say, <laughs> he's sort of waving at me, um, was you know that we 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 had kind of started the process as you saw from that film of. Uh, trapping yellow wagtails, tails, um, taking a blood sample, uh, ringing them, um, and recording their call as they were released, and photographing it. So the idea is that we've got a complete information set for a set of individuals. I think at this point we've only done about 19 birds, haven't we? Somehow we decided we hadn't done enough. Yeah, yet. that's so going to. Yeah, we're yeah. going to keep on doing that until we've got kind of enough of a sample to start to say something. More sensible, yeah. Um, yeah. but we hope that that will give us the kind of next generation of of analysis of the birds that we have in Sri Lanka, um, and that will cast more light on some of these questions. Yeah. Sorry, Gary and all. Uh, so my computer died. Uh, it's just uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's just you know it happened. <laughs> so anyway, sorry, sorry about that. So but yeah, I thought I tried to show you that. Uh, so we'll be uh, be kind of uh, uh, caught birds and. Uh, we uh, we try to get a very detailed uh, plumage, uh, uh, you know, scores, uh, molting scores, measurements, uh, as much as we could. Like about uh, basically every single primer, a uh, primary feather, every single secondary feather, we measured separate detail feathers, molting and all. On top of that, uh, we released the bird and uh, we were recording it with uh, the uh, Marans uh, solid set. Uh, recorder with a shotgun uh, microphone as well as in certain cases with a parabola so the full like try to get as much as possible information the the the, the real uh, to me as a uh, you know as a uh, biologist uh, the biggest issue is uh, not to rely on single single character uh, in this case uh, if we are relying on the the buzzy uh, the the chevron uh, in the flight call uh, or are we relying purely on a, on a one or two uh, uh, mitochondrial markers? That's uh, that's not fair, not fair for for most birders. So we have to go for an assortment of uh, characters uh, so that the 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 the, 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 the birders out in the out in the field as well as uh, uh, for the taxonomist uh, out in the labs or wherever. Uh, would have a great understanding about the the population uh, boundaries as well as uh, the characters that uh, are the species identifications in the field bird. So so that's the idea. So in that uh, video, what we try to uh, do that uh, to go to that next level and uh, try to get a complete uh, complete uh, repertoire of characters uh, recorded and reported, plus blood and uh, and then the molting. Uh, we will be working. I got the by the way. I got the, the permission to work in Karavalapitiya. Uh, hope the birds are still there. And uh, so we will do that uh, soon. Over to you. Great. Monitor, could I just ask a question? Yeah. So sure. Ashwin, I'd be really interested to just learn where you are with putting records onto eBird at this point, um, because uh, I think you're well ahead of us in terms of you know, kind of thinking that through and, you know, just as Sampath said, we, we kind of, it's difficult to know how to advise at this point um, as to, you know, what what one can clearly put down as Eastern Yellow Wagtail 
what can clearly put down as Western and what you should put down as a slash. Um, how do you handle that in, in India? So at the moment, um, our advice is to put every yellow wagtail in a slash unless it's uh, recorded. If it is recorded, it has to be a good enough uh, recording of light calls to at least uh, match a typical expectation, in uh, which case it's either put in Western or Eastern. But uh, the way we treat it now in, in, uh, in some parts of India is at least in the Western parts, we still assume everything to be Western by default, which may or may not be a reasonable assumption. Uh, but at the moment, we don't know any better. So at the moment, we treat all birds um, in um, Gujarat and Rajasthan and uh, all of these areas, the default expectation is Western. Uh, but maybe that will change. And uh, then we'll start moving to a slash, at least recommending a slash, and then whichever side has more evidence. And can I, can I add to Gary's question? Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in cases of where, like, now, previously, our understanding was everything, almost all, all the value of actors occurring here is Western Electrical. So the default choice, I think still the default choice in eBird is uh, Western Electrical. So in case that changes, and I think uh, that has happened in your side, is most probably in, uh, in, the, in the eastern side of West Bengal in those areas. How did you handle it? Uh, did you change the entire set of uh, how did it went on after I did find that this uh, is this is the other thing? So uh, it was a, a two year process in a way. Uh, so many bird watchers went out and recorded them and um, and recorded them and watched them in field, listened out. And we were um, looking for evidence of Western in all of these places. And it looked like uh, there was far more Eastern than Western. And over two years and multiple uh, seasons, this seemed to be the pattern in, uh, in West Bengal, in Assam, uh, in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And in these places, uh, the default option was then, after this uh, two-year examination of sorts, the default option was changed to Eastern rather than Western. And Western is now the one that requires um, strong evidence rather than Eastern in those areas. In the rest of the peninsula, in um, you know, um, in Eastern Tamil Nadu, and even in uh, the Bangalore region, Western is still the default option, and we still don't know uh, enough to uh, to overturn that. Uh, so, Western is still the default option. Eastern still requires evidence, but maybe in a year or two, we'll uh, know what can be done there. It's very likely in these areas that both wagtails are uh, reasonably abundant. Uh, and uh, both will have to be, both will, none, neither of them will be rare eventually. So let's see, let's see as the evidence builds up. So I think the best way is to let this evidence build up. Yeah. And then maybe take a call after a few years. Yeah. Thank okay. you. That's really helpful. Um, and I, I think where we are in Sri Lanka is, you know, that as you, as you say, we probably shouldn't be recording anything without some evidence. Um, yeah. And for those people who are on the call who've not yet got very familiar with the wagtails, um, Sampath was just referring to, and if, if you live around Colombo, re referring to a site that's emerged in the last few months, actually as a result of Monitor being very thorough about checking suitable sites at Karawala Pitya. Where we had a roost of um, well peaked at about twenty thousand yellow wagtails um, in November, I think it was, yeah. uh, and then fell back to when, last time I was there, which was before Christmas. I think it was about seven thousand five hundred birds. As far as I could tell, they were all eastern yellow wagtails on call. I was hearing no western yellow wagtails whatsoever. Um, but and you know that suggests that the bulk of the numbers here are eastern yellow wagtails, but. There's much to do before we can be yeah. you know, drawing that kind of conclusion. But yeah. um, I, I think you know there's th that's a great place to study yellow wagtails, and would strongly encourage you to get out in the field in the next, next few weeks as these birds now start to molt into their uh, breeding plumages. Now's a great time to be taking photographs and so on. Um, one thing actually on on that which I didn't mention, um, Ashwin, is that. Um, 
From what I can see, the luteas here depart earlier. I, I can't find any photographs of luteas after about the second week in February. 20th of February is the latest one I can find. And I don't know whether you, is that something that you pick up at all? That some of these, um, some of these birds move out earlier than others? I haven't noticed, no. It'd be interesting to see if that's Yeah, the we'll keep an eye out. Really struggle to find any photo. I think I can find, I found two photographs of luteas in full breeding plumage. All the rest are in this kind of, like the bird you photographed in Bangladesh in these kind of weird green plumages with, Mm. Uh, yellow supercilia, which may well be luteas, I don't know. Um, but they all yeah. seem to disappear. By, by the end of February, we're just down to things that look like, you know, grey-headed things and shishensis type things. Um, yeah, that's kind of all we have. Um, so yeah, and interesting to try and piece that, pit, that bit of the puzzle together as well. And Ashwin, uh, I have another question because, uh, because me personally, I've been doing birding for like maybe maybe 10 years. But uh, within that short period, I have seen a very, uh, very drastic changes of uh, yellow wagtail populations, especially in the South. Like uh, in, in the previous years, maybe three, four years ago, when we visit the Southern wetlands like Pumdala, Kalamati and those areas, we found yellow wagtails in thousands. Never knew which. We thought they were Eastern Elvactyl, but uh, but they were in big numbers. I think uh, Samtad might also add to this because he has done birding. They are uh, much more than I than I have done. So, uh, but now it, it, it's the numbers are very very low. Uh, we did the Asian water bird census few uh, days back. We finished. Uh, the, we do the southern region of Sri Lanka, and uh, we found like maybe maximum uh, ten yellow white tails altogether, right? That, that's quite surprisingly low uh, than the numbers. This was a, very similar to the last year. Last year also we found very low numbers. But I think about two, three years ago, uh, we saw like at least a few hundred, at least a few hundred or few thousand, close to a thousand. Uh, this is mostly the Western part. But I've, I've seen after, before, uh, maybe two years ago, I counted thousands of flying in, in, in the in Udawale area, which is a bit uh, uh, towards inland. Uh, but in the western side, uh, we are finding uh, good numbers of uh, yellow uh, Have you seen such kind of uh, changes in, in, the, in the population numbers in the recent years uh, in India, maybe in the east side or anywhere? Not that I have noticed, but uh, I think. Um... People may be based in areas with larger yellow wagtail congregations, a better place to say. Uh, I'll um, find out and maybe we can have a discussion in some of our regional groups and I'll uh, let you know. Around Bangalore, yeah. we're not, um, we have some places where we get a few hundred and those places we've been uh, getting few hundreds for many years now. And I don't see any obvious change. But again, I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, okay, great. And also, I think there's a question in the chat uh, by uh, Vihansit. Uh, I think I know Vihansit is, uh, I think, stationed in the eastern side. So also, in the recent years, I think uh, my friend Ravi has done several trips to the east. And uh, it seems like the western yellow, I mean, uh, yellow tail numbers are quite low in the eastern side. I think it's, it's, uh, it was different maybe if you years to at least a uh, few tens of years ago, ago uh, I think they even in the east they had good numbers of uh, yellow back tails. So yeah let's see I think a few years of uh, continuous data collection might uh, give us a good idea. Yeah. Okay okay uh, then uh, if anyone is having uh, is uh, have a question you can just ask you can unmute and ask from uh, from us. We, we will keep it as a casual discussion. Uh, so and uh, and one more thing, uh, uh, if anyone uh, or, or wants to speak in Singhala, uh, and if Ashwin, if anyone is uh, needs to speak in Hindi or Tamil uh, or uh, any language that you're familiar, you can uh, ask them to uh, ask the questions in that language. Uh, I can ask anyone if anyone's interested in asking. Singhaling Kauruari, Prashni Ahan Nonang, 
प्रश्न हाँ गेट लुआक मैं ट्रांसलेट कर लुआ हेलो हाय मैं सर सुष्मिता हूँ सो माय क्वेश्चन इज फ्रॉम द वैक्टर्स ओनली माइग्रेशन दे माइग्रेटेड इन द विंटर सीजन मेनली वैक्टर्स येलो वैक्टर्स माइग्रेटेड इज देयर एनी स्पेसिफिक फ्लाईवे और दे माइग्रेट लाइक इन व्हिच टाइप इन व्हिच हाउ दे माइग्रेट सो गैरी यू वांट टू टेक दैट Well, I can um, speculate. Um, so, in fact, before we started this call in the pre-chat, Ashwin and I were kind of musing on how this apparent dividing line between Western and Eastern, through the centre of India, roughly, might be coming about. And it, 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 it's generally felt, and um, uh, Sampath can comment on this based on his recent studies, that land birds are. Uh, 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 avoid crossing the, the 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 Himalayas, so we're expecting that eastern yellow wagtails are going to come around the eastern end of the Himalayas, and the birds that we are seeing that are eastern yellow wagtails, from the you know like the diagram that Sampath showed, come through Bangladesh and down the east coast of India to Sri Lanka, and presumably are occurring throughout eastern India, and then there's the western populations that are coming um, either south. Um, on the western side of the Himalayas, or from further west, coming southeast along the coast, like Lutia, is potentially coming along the coast of western India, and you're ending up with western yellow wagtails in the western part of of India, um, and seemingly, from what we're seeing so far, probably not reaching Sri Lanka in large numbers. So there's this kind of uh, western route. Into Western India and then an eastern route through Bangladesh into Eastern India and Sri Lanka is our musing at this point. I would say um, we don't have any firm evidence for that really whatsoever, but that's kind of what the picture we are imagining. Ashwin, does that? How does that sound? That sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Stumpath, is there anything you can add to that? Because I know you've been, you know, the work you've been doing on migration routes, albeit with bigger birds, with um, lots of satellite trackers on, has been uh, uh, has been very revealing. Uh, Gary, uh, yes, uh, the one that uh, uh, sorry, I kind of missed the, uh, the the question, but I I, I gather what you said that uh, about the, the the eastern and ba the Bangladesh where well, Bangladesh route, I yeah, think. So that is asking uh, yeah. on the routes, migration routes of. Uh, Oh, I see. I see. Ah, oh, okay. Cool. Uh, the the uh, yeah. I mean, the bigger birds, like the the, the forest birds or uh, insectivores or the grassland birds, like uh, uh, the wagtails. Uh, they might all uh, could use uh, very different routes, in my opinion. But uh, the one that I showed in the Bangladesh, the eastern route is actually an insectivore, uh, barn swallow dance. So that is a kind of a because it's an insectivore as well as it's, a, it's kind of an open country bird. So that gives some clues of uh, where some of these birds might come from. Um, the larger grasslands uh, north of us are in Kazakhstan and in the in the Russia as well as in the uh, Turkmenistan and uh, north of uh, Afghanistan and so on. So that uh, would be very interesting uh, where what. Where those birds would come from, like you know, where would take? Uh, uh, they go to uh, uh, to Africa and uh, making African birds all Western, or some of them actually. I think we lost him. Oh. Okay. Into uh, uh, Gujarat uh, and then into uh, Maharashtra to uh, Kerala and South. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have no clue. Uh, only thing, uh, sadly, the type of tagging that we do, we can't. Uh, would uh, give us better, better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, 
I think we lost him. Uh, uh, the, the signal might be locked. Okay, anyway, uh, I will uh, just, uh, uh, yeah, uh, now since we have taken so much time, uh, we can finish up very quickly. I will just for a very few questions. Okay, I asked about the, uh, okay. Uh, uh, we discussed on the vocalization. And uh, one more thing, uh, what, what do you think Ashwin uh, and Gary uh, of, 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 the, of the white eye patch of possible uh, Sushanti's, uh, I mean, nomi nominate race words uh, in identification, like uh, it was previously, I think one, one of the reasons to think that the, all the those birds, at least a small peck, peck of white, uh, like kind of beamer like looking birds, but now it, it seems like it's not the case, right? Uh, that, that seems to be on uh, so many birds of Eastern origin, right? Yeah, I think this, um, so I think this idea that there's some sort of introgression between um, gray headed forms in the Western part of the Siberian range and white superciliate forms in the Eastern part. And, you know, you've got birds that are, have um, every kind of shade of integrate between the two from little tiny bits of white in front of the eye to broken supercilia right the way through to clear supercilia is kind of what you'd expect if that's the case and you know and indeed you know based on the kind of leapfrog migration idea those are the exact birds we'd expect to see particularly in sri lanka yeah so um you know that kind of fits completely as a as a as a, as a nice explanation of the story i think ashwin what, what do you see uh, we again see uh, we see the entire range really uh, even in the even in south india um, anything from a small broken supercilium to none at all and uh, this is something we um, we always acknowledged was present in our uh, what we call tunbaji back then and we always thought uh, some amount of a supercilium was fine uh, but uh, that story has become more complex now and uh, there was that really uh, there's an interesting paper uh, recently where they they measured um, various morphological features and plumage characters in uh, across that entire range and i think um, the extent of supercilium or the proportion of birds mm. with uh, advanced supercilium increases as you go further east and i think there's a very clear uh, there's a very clear progression was that the paper in Dutch birding? Yeah, the Alpha. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a very nice paper, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's very a lovely nice. paper. And I really recommend everybody reads that paper. It's really, it's really nice. Yeah. One of the things that was in that paper is um analysis of song, um, which you know hasn't generally been something of particular much use on the wintering grounds. But you know, this recently place that Modit found yeah. um, in in um it's gone up. Yeah. in Colombo, which has this huge, <laughs> it's very smelly, <laughs> uh, huge piles of compost. It's perfect uh, feeding area for yellow wagtails, you know, lots and lots of flies. And it does appear as though birds are establishing short-term winter territories and and in part singing at each other. Um, and so uh, it, it, it does seem likely that we'll be able to get some song information yeah. as well. I've, I've got a few recordings so far, all of which come out as what they call the fast type song. Flight. And in fact, very much characteristic of the Eastern birds, the Shishensis from Alaska and further east. Um, but the database for that is very small. So too early to draw any conclusions. And of course, they make so much uh, incidental noise. It's difficult to be absolutely certain a bird is actually singing rather than just making kind of lots of odd, odd calls. So um, that's that's an area that might possibly emerge as being of interest as well. Okay. Uh, so if anyone has uh, any other questions or something to discuss, uh, uh you can ask now uh otherwise we can uh end the meeting so uh let me summarize uh, i mean uh, if uh, for for the for the uh noise birders here so if if you see a wet tail like uh, it's uh but uh, so far as we discussed it, it's best to leave it uh, i mean uh, uh, record it as a slash uh, unless you get a very good uh, recording of the fall or it's uh, in a very typical type of uh, plumage. 
Uh, am I correct, uh, Ashwin? Yes. Yeah. So we can. Uh, that's the most safest and uh, uh, best way to uh, record these things. And uh, then uh, with the uh, with uh, with data gathered throughout the years, we can uh, come into a conclusion with the uh, how to keep uh, the defaults of uh, species access and all these things, right? Okay, so uh, it seems like there's uh, no more questions. So we can end it. So first, uh, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, it was very, very interesting. And uh, uh, as uh, I must say, because uh, as soon as you did uh, these findings in, uh, in Sri Lanka, and uh, uh, as we read uh, your finding actually in India, and you and all your colleagues, uh, and uh, when uh, when we started to see these things uh, that we thought once uh, as Western advocates, but it's not the case, it seems, and it's very interesting. So I wanted to uh, bring uh, out this message to all our all the birders here in Sri Lanka. So uh, our group uh, we all discussed, and uh, after Gary's uh, published paper, we wanted to like uh, take it out for a bigger, bigger audience. So that was the main idea of this uh, talk. So then we thought, why just Sri Lanka? Uh, you guys are doing a great job over there in India, and you guys have uh, you uh, uh, you guys are ahead of us, especially in recording and even stuff. So we can get something from that also. So we thought uh, we should uh, join uh, get Ashwin and Ashwin also. So and uh, Dr. Sampath, uh, Professor Sampath, sorry, uh, uh, gave a great description on the genetics and how. Uh, how uh, the birds can be resolved uh, genetically and further proof uh, that uh, what sort of uh, birds are offering here. So I should thank you very much uh, for dedicating your time for this. I think uh, this is not the end. I think this is just like maybe the beginning of this. Let's Hopefully. keep uh, yeah. Let's keep in touch and uh, uh, do more work here, and uh, we, we might uh, we will get uh, some good results. And thank you all. Uh, who participated and uh, all who commented and uh, and discussed uh, with us here, uh, who all joined uh, for the discussion. Uh, it is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. It is uh, very, very uh, interesting and uh, pretty cool. Uh, so, uh, Again, uh, I thank all who participated, and uh, I must thank Dr. Professor Sampath also for letting, uh, giving us this Zoom link uh, to uh, hold this participation. And also, I thank all my friends uh, who we are doing, uh, organizing these things in our uh, Facebook group, uh, Sri Lanka Bird Identification and Discussion Group. Uh, and thank you very much, all, uh, and I wish you all a good night. Uh, let's meet again. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks, Modita, for bringing us all together. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, Modita. Fantastic. Thanks for convening us. Really appreciate it. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.